These stories are meant to be pondered over. They are not just stories. There is a meaning behind them all. This is the definition for the word ponder. Verb. Think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. I pondered the question of what clothes to wear to the occasion. Synonyms. Thinking about. Contemplate. Consider. Review. Reflect on. Mull over. Meditate on. Use on. Deliberately about. Deliberate about. Cognate on. Dwell on. Brood on. Ruminate on. Chew over. Puzzle over. Turn over in one's mind. Overthink. She had time to ponder over the incident. The jeweler and the thief. Well, let's continue with this incredible story. The dragons, when they first saw the youngsters entering the cave many moons ago, weren't interested in the slightest betraying man. You see, man was one of their major troubles. There's even a dragon slayer profession in the British Isles. Yet, at that same time, they could see the potential in these young things. As a matter of fact, they were more evolved than them when they were young. Back then, the dragons didn't even have a glimmer of life. So, they had an eternal discussion amongst themselves. Do you think they can train them? Do you think they can change even in China and Tibet, war ruled the land. Anger was the norm. Mind you, these youngsters had a combination of light and darkness. They could see both sides of the coin. So the tech dragons decided to train them. Now their tra training wasn't like today. Today, children in school are bored. They are taught to use just memory. They are taught to remember facts. They are not taught to use your mind and think. The dragons are experts in this field. They are the master wizards of Hogwarts today. In fact, they are thousands of years ahead in development. Hogwarts teachers would be in nursery school. The dragons would have advanced <clears throat> PhD studies in the universe. They were off the charts. The dragons had a unique style of teaching. You could say it was revolutionary today. They taught by using games, play, and fireside chats. The first game they taught was hide and seek. This was a very practical game. They had a series of talks about the universe. They were taught that the universe existed inside of them. Well, to be frank, that was completely over their head. They couldn't even understand one word. So the dragons played a game of hide and seek. The dragons would hide. The youngsters closed their eyes and counted to ten. One. Ready or not, here we come. They would open their eyes, and all the dragons were gone. The dragons had rules they couldn't keep the king. All the kids 
were completely shocked when they opened their eyes. All the dragons disappeared. They all passed in surprise. As you know, dragons are quite large. They weigh thousands of pounds. This game went on for around six months or so. Finally, at one fireside chat, the dragon told this practical story. Imagine two young men walking down the road. They were headed to a town five days from their current destination. One of their men was a jeweler. The other man was a thief. The thief knew this man had a very precious jewel that he was carrying. As I said, both of them were going to the same town. They decided to travel together. They had a long journey ahead of them. Hours passed. They were quite tired and exhausted. Fortunately, there was a simple inn ahead of them. They both decided to spend the night there share a room together. Both of them decided to have dinner together. The jeweler went first, and a few minutes later, the thief joined him. While the jeweler was hiding, was holding the table for him, the thief was looking all over for the precious jewel. He was quite dumbfounded. He was the greatest thief in the land. They had dinner and went to bed together. They weren't in the mood to drink the hell and party into the night. Well, guess what? This went on for several days. Um, they reached their destination. By then, the thief was totally confused. He thought, this is going to be an easy sell. He said to the jeweler, I'm a thief. As a matter of fact, I'm a king of the thieves. I knew you were carrying a precious jewel. Every night I knew you hit. Every night I knew you carried a precious jewel. I knew you hid the jewel inside of the room. Every night I would search all over for it. I got quite frustrated when I couldn't find it. Where did you put it? I'm dying for an answer. The jeweler said, I knew. You were a thief. I knew you wanted to steal the jewel. Every night, I would hide it in a place and you would never look. The thief said, and where is that? The jeweler said, under your own pillow. The thief knew he was outwitted and outsmart. Well, the kids loved this story. They were well acquainted with thieves and jewels. They went through their towns quite frequently. The dragon said, let's play a game of hide and seek again. This time, focus on your breath. Close your eyes. To their amazement, the dragons appeared inside of them. They couldn't believe it. How could all the dragons appear to them inside of their being? This was the starting point of their incredible adventures. Now, when they played hide and seek, they knew where to look. A single but necessary step took place. They knew it was both an inward and outward journey. The youngsters were thrilled. Each time they played the game, the youngsters knew where to look. They loved to play this game. All the first time students had to go through the same baby steps that others went through. You see, this path is two steps forward and one step backwards. You learn from your progress and your mistakes. Never give up. An old Cherokee is teaching his grandson about life. A fight is going on inside me, he said to the boy. It's a terrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. 
he continued. The other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The Yodge Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. Once upon a time, there were two twin brothers named Little Ricky and Little Johnny. Little Johnny was a, genius, was a genius in picking up and learning new things, while Little Ricky was what you would call on the slow side. It took him hundreds of tries to learn new things. For example, <coughs> one Christmas morning, their wonderful parents presented them both with brand new bicycles. Both of them were so excited. Well, they took them out though. Little Johnny hopped on his and immediately started riding down the block. Well, Little Ricky didn't have the same luck. In fact, it was kind of funny to see how clumsy he was. He didn't give up. He knew deep down inside he could learn how to ride this. It took him about a month. <laughs> the first time he realized that he was actually riding the bicycle, he was filled with joy. He was so grateful. I did it. I did it. I didn't give up. This incident carried him all throughout his life. Every time he had to learn something new, he remembered the experience of learning how to ride a bike. In fact, years later, his wife said that he learned things so quickly. Little Ricky just smiled. <coughs> he knew that life taught him such a precious lesson, lesson at such a young age. Never give up, persevere. You can learn anything. It may just take you time. Little Ricky loved ethnic foods. He was brought up since he was born to eat ethnic foods. He absolutely loved them. Yet, he never knew how to cook them. One day in high school, he enrolled in a cooking class. He wanted to learn how to cook. To his amazement, he learned that there was cooking recipes that you can follow to make each dish. A recipe usually has a list of ingredients along with the actual step-by-step -steps needed to make the dish. He was so excited. From that precious course, he learned, he took, he learned hundreds of recipes throughout the years. He took the same concept to his own personal life. He learned how to use spices like kindness and patience in his life. He would sprinkle these on his daily actions. He knew that life was an incredible adventure. He added these precious spices to his everyday affairs. Ponder this over. What spices can you use to enhance your life? Kindness, tolerance, patience, love, and compassion. These are incredible spices that the world loves. Learn how to avoid the spice of anger, being a bully and fighting. These never are good in the end. They are old habits from the past. When I was young, I heard the story about three blind men touching an elephant. 
Each band touched a different part of the elephant. One touched the elephant's ear, another touched his feet, while the last touched the tusk. They began to discuss their experience and a huge fight began. I'm right and you're wrong. I know all the answers. You're a fool to believe in that. What a child you are. Yet they all had their own individual experience. It was a piece of the puzzle. Not the puzzle itself, but a piece. Are we like the blind man touching the elephant? My religion is better than your religion. I'm going to heaven while you're going to hell. I'm going to declare war on you. I'm going to convert you. Religion has a piece of the puzzle. It is not the puzzle itself. Each religion is different and unique. The essence is the same. Which part of the elephant did you touch? Maybe it's about time to be open to something new. Your enemy is talking about the same thing you are. He just has a different piece, a different point of view. In the end, the essence is the same. Stop the noise in your head. As the children began to learn how to meditate, they saw how powerful the mind is. They never noticed that before. But they asked the dragon, how to stop the noise in my head? Of course, all the dragons laughed. They laughed because everyone goes through this. You see, the mind is the most difficult thing to control in the universe. The majority of man reacts in every situation. Man just reacts. The wise man learns to be proactive. They understand the basic law. It's my will alone. I set my mind in motion. Now, that's very easy to say. But hard to do. All people who learn how to meditate in the beginning have this problem. In the East, they call it monkey mind. The monkey goes from one branch to another. It can't be controlled. Well, when they first started to learn how to meditate, they clearly saw this from first hand experience. The dragon told a wonderful story. Time the subject was brought up. They told a story where a man saves a gene. Nobody knows exactly how this man saved it. Well, the genie told this man, you can have as many wishes as you want. The man said, wow, that's incredible. I love that idea. The genie said, well, there's a cat. The man said, well, what's that? You must always give one wish after another. If you don't, I will chop your head off with the sword. Are you sure you want to continue with this? The man hesitates for a moment and says, reluctant to her. Well, the genie said, what's your first wish? The man gives one wish after another. It seems like when one wish is granted, he has to give another. He didn't even have one opportunity to enjoy, even for a second, the previous wish. He was getting tired and couldn't even go to sleep. The journey, he was always harassing him and saying, what's your next wish? Well, fortunately, there was a wise man nearby. He went to the wise man and sincerely asked for help. This bone was turning into a curse. 
the wise man whispered to his ear. Well, the genie demanded another wish, or he would chop off his head. The young man said, Go to the forest and find the huge log. Your wish is my command. In a second, he returned with the huge log. The genie said with a smile, smile, Give me a wish, I will chop off your head. As you can see, the genie wasn't particularly nice. So the young man told the genie to go up and down the pole. When I need you, I will give you another command. The young man could relax and enjoy all the wishes he gave to the genie. The genie knew he was outsmarted by this wise man. The young boy enjoyed his life and helped others in the community. He eventually learned about the dragon and helped tremendously his fellow man. The dragon said that the genie is the mind. The mind wants to control you versus the other way around. By placing your mind on your breath, the genie will go up and down the log and set you free. Meditation is the key to bring awareness to your mind. The mind is either your friend or foe. Everyone in the universe has to learn how to control the mind. Mirror, mirror, on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? What if we had an actual mirror that exists inside of us? Wouldn't that be an incredible fairy tale? Now what if I told you that you are the universe? You just don't know it. How's that for a fairy tale? You see, your mirror is dusty. Throughout your life, nobody told you that this mirror exists inside of you. Well, let the fairy tale begin. You can start learning how to clean your precious mirror. You can start by being kind in each and every moment. The more you are kind, the more you will clean your mirror. Learn how to meditate and enjoy the silence inside of you. At first, you may get bored, but the more you practice, the more you are clearing your mirror. Remember, this is play, not work. Cleaning your mirror is like removing huge boulders that you carry around. They weigh you down. Each time you remove a boulder, you get lighter and lighter. You see, you are your own Prince Charming. You have the capability to remove all obstacles inside of you. Now that's a fairy tale. Ponder this over. You are the universe. You just don't know it. This is a beautiful fable by Hans Christian Andersen. It's a beautiful summer day. The sun shines warmly on the old house in Mirror River. Behind the house, a mother duck is sitting on ten eggs to chick. One by one, all the eggs break open. All except one. This one is the biggest egg of all. Mother duck sits and sits on the big egg. At last, it breaks open to chick, to chick. Out jumps, jumps, the last baby duck. It looks big and strong. It is gray and ugly. The next day, mother duck 
takes all her little ducks to the water. She jumps into it. All her baby ducks jump in. The big ugly duckling jumps in too. They all swim and play together. The ugly duckling swims better than all the other ducklings. Quack quack! Come with me to the farmyard, says Mother Duck to her baby ducks, and they all follow her there. The farmyard is very noisy. The poor duckling is so unhappy there. The hens pick him. The roosters flies at him. The ducks bite him. The farmer picks him. Alas! One day he runs away. He comes to a river. He sees many beautiful big birds swimming there. Their feathers are so white, their necks so long, their wings are so pretty. The little duckling looks and looks at them. He wants to be with them. He wants to stay and watch them. He knows they are swans. Oh, how he wants to be beautiful like them! Now it is winter. Everything is white with snow. The river is covered with ice. The ugly duckling is very cold and unhappy. Spring comes once again. The sun shines warmly. Everything is fresh and green. One morning, the ugly duckling sees the beautiful swans again. He knows them. He wants so much to swim with them in the river, but he is afraid of them. He wants to die. So he runs into the river. He looks into the water. There, in the water, he sees a beautiful swan. It is he. He is no more an ugly duck. He is a beautiful white swan. We are all swans. We just don't have the eyes to see. Look inside of your heart. You will see your true nature. The wind and the sun were disputing which was stronger. Suddenly, they saw a traveler coming down the road, and the sun said, "I see a way to decide our dispute. Whatever of us can cause the traveler to take off his cloak should be regarded as the stronger." You begin. So the sun retired behind a cloud, and the wind. Began to blow him as hard as it could upon the traveler, but harder he blew, the more closely the traveler wrapped his cloak around him. Till at last, the wind had to give up in despair. Then the sun came out and shone, shone, shined in all its glory upon the traveler, who soon found it too hard, too hot to walk with his cloak on. Kindness affects more than severity. Once upon a time, a wise man was having a conversation with the sun. He told the sun that darkness did not like him. He felt that the sun ruined everything for him. Darkness loves to keep everyone in a state of ignorance. Darkness loves to see humanity bickering and fighting with one another. The sun just loved to shine and give love. Kindness and compassion to all. Well, the sun said to the wise man, "Bring darkness to me, and we can have a wonderful conversation." The wise man said, "I will bring him to you tomorrow, 
while the sun waited and waited. The next day, darkness never came. He waited for over a month. Darkness never showed up. You see, darkness is only the absence of light. The sun is always shining, so darkness can never appear. Discover the light inside of you. That is your true nature. My brother and I were born December 24, 1952, in Pasadena, California. We had an incredible childhood. My dad and grandfather owned an aerospace company. The first house I remembered was near an orange grove. My brother and I would sneak through the fence and walk in the orange grove. There was a tree house and we'd climb up on it. We were probably three years old. Our house was years ahead of its time. My father and grandfather were both inventors. They developed a house where you could walk in the house, clap your hands, and the lights would come on. The outlets weren't on the walls, but hidden in the carpets. We had sensors that when it rained, the windows would close. My mom would watch us in the backyard by a video camera while she was cooking dinner. This house was featured in a Los Angeles Times home selection. This is back in the early 50s. In the early 2000s, I saw a Burger King commercial where my mom was making hamburgers. The frying pan was floating in the air. The stove used induction coils. At that same time period, they developed a Jeep that could shoot at its tires and nothing would happen. This Jeep could float downstream. It was lighter and got more miles per gallon than the standard Jeep. They tried to get the United States government to buy the Jeeps, but after several years of losing bids, they saw the handwriting on the wall. If you don't have inside connections with the government, you could have a futuristic Jeep and nobody would care. During this time, they came up with a way to make houses that would cost one-tenth of the present day house. It was all modular. They could put up a complete house in a week. The trade union was strongly opposed to this. Consequently, it was never marketed. I guess those early years really had an impact on me. I subconsciously adapted to always looking towards the future and bring that technology back to the present. One of my first was multimedia. Even before multimedia was born, I had a company with a good longtime friend, John Slavsky. We developed a visual database for the real estate market. We could put in a search for a house, and all the house which matched the criteria the house would come up. When you saw a house you liked, it would take you on the tour of the house. The program won awards at trade shows, but it was far too ahead of its time. We developed some trial photo database programs for the Department of Justice but finally lost to IBM, who bidded one dollar for the job. One of my first impressions when I was young was that when my brother and I was born, that I said I, I said to him, you go first and check it out. My brother remembers going down a long, bright tunnel in ecstasy and then told me to come down. I remember it was a rush and both of us laughed inside. When we were young, my brother and I had our own telepathic communication with each other. A lot of people thought we had communication problems because we didn't talk English very well. I remember our state of communication was nonverbal, but with thoughts, pictures, emotions, and experience. It was like you wanted to know about an apple, and you never seen one. Talking was one way to explain about an apple. Another way was to graphically send the experience of an apple. I remember hearing stories about tribes in the South Sea Islands who would communicate with their loved ones telepathically. Today, we use telephones. Our sense of communication is more physical. It's kind of funny that people think it is mystical when it's probably very natural. We have simply not used this communication, so we forget ever had this ability. 
for now, we scope at the idea that men can communicate in ways that we don't imagine. My brother and I loved to play jokes when we were kids. I remember that one joke we played was on our bus driver coming home from kindergarten. As the bus driver drove us home, we realized that our mom wasn't home. Usually, when this is the case, the driver can't release you. You have to return to kindergarten. My brother and I definitely didn't want this to happen. As soon as the bus stopped, my brother and I ran out the bus and ran to our front door. It was locked. So we ran to the back of the house and entered another door. The bus driver was amazed. He knew what happened. He started to yell, open the door. You have to return to kindergarten. We both made faces. Fortunately, my mom came home and resolved the situation. When my brother and I were babies, my mom put fingernail polish on one of us to tell us apart. We used this to our advantage growing up. In the fifth grade, we would switch classes for the fun of it. All the kids in the class would get a kick out of that. One incident that still remains to this day is the following. One day, while we were in high school, my dear friend Mark Blackburn and his uncle Carl took my brother on a boat ride. It takes probably half an hour to reach the ocean from where we took off in the harbor. When we got off the harbor, we moved left to where we directly off the chrono where my brother and I served as a kid. We were sitting there, and all of a sudden, we feel this tremendous rush of energy <coughs> with thousands of bubbles underneath the boat. It's kind of scary. Finally, this huge well emerges to the surface, probably 10 feet away. When I saw its eyes, it was such an incredible sight. Pure wisdom, <coughs> kindness, compassion, and supreme intelligence. Today, today, this day's Probably 46 years later, I can still envision this in my mind's eye. I always was in love with dolphins and whales, but to see one in the wild like this was truly a gift. I could sense and see the magnificence of such a beautiful creature of God. If he wanted to, he could completely destroy the boat, but that's not its nature. We need to learn from the dolphins and whales in our lives. They have so much we can learn from. Mark McClellan. Mark had a huge influence in my life. We were neighbors. He lived across the street. I spent many hours with Mark and his family. Mark is extremely kind and loves the adventures of life. He loves to snow ski and spent many years snow skiing. Mark introduced me to many different kinds of music. He was always sharing me different points of view. People like to be around Mark. Kevin Charles, another good childhood friend, said to me about a year ago, who wouldn't like Mark? 
Mark is the kindest person I have ever met. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Mark has a spark of life. Maybe he gets that spark from his dad. Spark is his dad's name. Knowing someone that long, Mark has a deep place in my heart. We have had many incredible adventures along the way. I call Mark about four times a year to keep in touch with him. Mark will be forever be young at heart. He loves life and life loves him. Nick Roth. I have known Nick since junior high school. We went on many surfing adventures in high school. Nick is one of those guys that whatever he touches <coughs> turns to gold. He was good at whatever sport he played. In. He had surfing. It seemed he was destined to be a surfer. If Nick was young today, he would be in my eyes one of the best servers in the world. He would have tons of money. Nick doesn't serve for fame, fortune, or glory. He serves because it's a part of his life. He is an artist when it comes to serving. He has nothing to prove. He just smiles like a wise man. One funny story is about Nick and his tech. He would call me an electric man. He said my voice would sound like an electric computer. Years later, I stopped and pondered what he said. It seems like his subconscious was onto something. He was picking something up about me and couldn't quite pinpoint it. To this day, he was one of the only people who picked up that I was different. Nick moved from Orange County to Depot Bay about 10 years ago. He still serves at 64 years old. I saw him for the first time in years, and we connected. That time is endless. It just seems like yesterday we saw each other. In fact, it was over 30 years ago. Nick? Nick is definitely a web in my life. We have had many great journeys together. Mark Blackburn. I've known Mark since kindergarten. Mark has a place in my heart. We have been good friends for years. He loves adventure. Mark is extremely intelligent and humorous at the same time. Good traits to have. He always has a, a wise crack you can see from his mouth. He is actually listening to you. Another good trait. We have been friends for so long that <laughs> anything goes. We don't try to change one another. Another good trait. Both of us are in the same field, IT. So we know what's going on in the hiring and firing in our industry. We both laugh and cry in the absurdities of life. We talk around four times a year. It's nice to hear about his life's adventure. Mark just completed a childhood dream when he was 10 years old. Here's a Facebook post that Mark posted on April 19, 2017. It described his sense for adventure in life. Mark, why I climbed the pyramid? The year was 1963. I was 10 years old attending Mariners Elementary School in Newport Beach, California. We had a school assembly. The father of a student that a handful of my friends might remember gave a slight presentation in the cafeteria of their family's summer vacation trip to Mexico. Many things impressed me, but I was utterly astonished and enchanted to learn 
that Mexico had pyramids. Up to that point, I thought only Egypt had pyramids. The sides clearly show that, that the, this family was allowed to climb to the top of the pyramids. From that instant, it has been a dream of mine to climb to the top of the pyramid. So yes, it took me 23 years to finally make good on that dream. The cost was minimal, $300 round trip airfare from San Francisco airport to Mexico. Mexico is on sale right now. For whatever reason, the peso is down against the greenback. Rental cars can be had for $4 a day. Decent hotels for $40 a night. A fine inducement to go now was the fact that UNESCO is trying to make it illegal to climb all pyramids. A gringo, Baracho, a drunk American, fell off Chichen Itza a few years ago to his death and has been closed for climbing ever since. I wanted to go before all of them were closed. It was a fantastic and surreal experience. I am extremely glad I went. I am now glad I was a spy for the NSA in Central America in the late 70s and still retain much of my Spanish speaking listening ability, which is mandatory for that job. The classmate whose father gave the presentation was Paul Cohen. Does anyone remember what became of him? I suspect he went to Cronin de Mar, not Newport Harbor High School. Since I was sent to my reform school in Hawaii during the last two years of Newport Harbor High, I lost track of many folks. That said, I must be at least eight good Facebook friends who attend Mariners with me and might even remember that slideshow. I cannot put in words how satisfying it was to be at the top of the pyramid on the sun on a good Friday. Incidentally, I chose that day to go believing I would have Tenochtitlan to myself because everyone in this Catholic nation would be at church. No, they were all at Tenochtitlan. Avoid holidays. On a normal day, the UNESCO historical site 40 minutes north of Mexico City will have 10,000 visitors. On Good Friday, there were 40,000. Bucket list them accomplished. I have one friend and one relative who has climbed the pyramid, Les Jones and my cousin, Gail Demmer Saracen. Both of them certified these over 50 years earlier. Who else has? Paul Cohen. I really believe in synchronicity. This is from Wikipedia. Synchronicity is a concept first explained by analytical psychologist Carl Jung, which holds that events are meaningful coincidences if they occur with no casual relationship yet seem to be meaningful related. This post to Paul God's theory got started by synchronicity of events. My friend Mark, see above, goes to Mexico and visits the pyramid at the Noche Line, just outside Mexico City. This is his childhood dream. When he was 10 years old, he listened to the adventures at a lecture given by Paul Cohen's dad. Paul's family spent the summer in Mexico and Guatemala. Paul's dad was a doctor and did volunteer work for the summer. Mark never knew that Mexico had pyramids. So, Mark goes to Mexico and posts his adventures on Facebook. I read the post and thought, whatever happened to Paul? We go back to first grade. I haven't spoken or heard about Paul for over 46 years. <laughs> That's a long time. So, Here's where synchronicity starts kicking in. Mark posts on Facebook. Mary Lou Picard sees the post. Mary Lou Picard. Paul Cohen is in Colorado Springs, Mark. I spoke with him last summer. I'm sure he loved to hear about your adventure and has family inspired you. He's on Facebook, albeit very seldom. He does check it. 
Mark Blackburn. Mary, thanks so much. I found Paul's Facebook page, which you are correct. He hasn't used since 2015. <coughs> Still, next time in Colorado Springs, I may try to look him up. Paul Cohen. Mark, so nice to read your posts. I'm looking forward to a react reconnecting with you. Wow, it was nice reading of your trip to Mexico. Very cool. Interesting how you had that intent for so many years. I think our visit to Mexico and Guatemala long ago led to a couple, couple year volunteer in Laos, Southeast Asia. Mark Blackburn, Paul, great to hear from you and know yours, you are alive and presumably well. I vividly remember your father narrating that slideshow to this day. Traveling that far from home was not so common in those days. How long have you been in Colorado Springs? Paul? Huh, yes, mostly well, thank you. Good to hear for you as well. Wow, this is an amazing story. So fun that you did that. I'm enjoying seeing your video posts. Looks like you had an incredible trip. Are you back in the United States now? A friend of mine made that same climb this time of year, just two years ago. We really enjoyed it. <coughs> I moved to the Springs about 25 years ago and liked it. Are you in Seattle? French and Grove. Oh my God, Paul Cohen. Facebook has become old home week for me recently. I don't know if you remember me or not. It's fun hearing what my classmates are doing all these years later. Happy to hear tidbits about you. Mark Blackburn, Mark McClellan, and others. Yay Mariners, Ensign, and or Newport Harbor High School alumni. So then I send uh, Paul a request. I see that Paul's on Facebook, so I send him a Facebook friendly request. Paul responds, Richard, Paul Cohen has confirmed you that you're friends on Facebook. So yesterday, I was looking at Mark Blackburn's chapter. I decided to add Paul's picture. This is from the previous chapter. The classmate whose father gave the presentation was Paul Cohen. Does anyone remember what became of him? I suspect he went to Crown Del Mar, not Newport High School. I get out my Newport Harbor yearbook and snap this picture and insert it above. I sent Paul a message. Hi Paul, it's been many moons since we've last seen each other. I was visiting some friends last summer in Colorado Springs. I tried to look, look you up. Anyway, maybe next time. Paul, first, Mary Picard. Mark, now my friend Rick. Haha, <laughs> can't believe it, what's happening? Wow. Rick, earliest of friends. So then we get on the phone and start talking for a few hours. Now we haven't talked since high school, but we had instant communication. It's amazing to see how a series of events connect each one of us. If Mary Lou Picard didn't contact Paul, or Mark didn't do a post of his adventures on Facebook, I wouldn't have been in contact with Paul. I remember as a kid, I was fascinated by Paul's house. It was a Japanese style house. From what I remember, they had a courtyard with their rooms coming off from it. Instead of having ordinary doors, they had soji doors. Now as a kid, I loved anything from the Far East. I loved things outside of the box. Paul's house was stuck in a neighborhood with all standard houses of the time. The front of the house was standard, but nobody knew the jewel inside. Paul's dad was a doctor. I saw him a few times when I was a kid. Paul's dad was my brother's David primary doctor. Back then, it wasn't unusual for a doctor treating a patient smoking a cigar. Paul and I were great friends in elementary school. I learned over the phone that Paul had been to about the same number of countries that I have been, around 35. He spent two years in Laos doing voluntary work. Paul tried to go to India. 
He had the plane tickets, but unfortunately, the Bhopal gas tragedy happened in India. When Paul tried to get a visa, he was denied. Paul was a lawyer at the time. The Indian government would give him a visa. They thought he was going to India to work on the Bhopal gas tragedy. Paul tried to tell him he was going just as a, tur as a tourist, <laughs> but they wouldn't listen. It's a small world. Paul's mom got remarried. Her husband was a member of the Beek family from Newport Beach. I went to junior high school with his niece, Carol. This is the story from the Balboa Island Museum about the Beek family. In 1919, Joseph Allen Beek obtained the rights in the city of Newport Beach to provide a ferry service across the Newport Harbor between Balboa Island and the Balboa Peninsula. Before starting the ferry service, Big owned the Ark. The Ark consisted of a giant rowboat with a small engine, which Big used as the first ferry vessel. The Ark carried oars in the event of engine failure. There was no regular scheduled service, and customers telephoned Big when they needed a ride across the, the harbor. In 1919, Big charged a nickel, five cents per person. Three years after commencing operation, Beek built the, the Fat Ferry. This vessel held 20 passengers. Beek later built a small one, cars, a car barge with a Fat Ferry pushed across in front of it. In the 1950s, Beek built three double-ended wooden boats for his ferry service, the Admiral, the Commandeer, and the Captain. These Two boats are still in service and have transported over two million persons. Each ferry holds three cars and 75 people. As of 2007, the Beaks charge $1 per adult, $2 per vehicle, and $0.50 cent for children ages 5 through 11, $1.25 for adults on bikes, $0.75 cents for children on bikes, and $1.50 for motorcycles children under the age of five or three. The ferry boat needs constant maintenance, but this does not usually interrupt the ferry service. For two weeks in 2008, the ferry service shut down for an extended period for the first time in 50 years to rebuild the automobile ramps leading to the boats. Currently, Big's three sons run the business and has been the family for close to 100 years. Paul tells me his stepdad is an incredible character. He is in his 90s. He's driven the same Volkswagen since the 70s. Who knows how many miles he has traveled on it. Paul says he has a unique ability for photographic memory. Here's a definition of photographic memory. The ability to remember information or visual images in great detail. He also loves computers. He was involved in the early days when computer science was still in its infancy. I would love to meet him someday. He seems like the character I would love to be around. Paul says he loves to travel on the Amtrak train between Los Angeles and San Francisco. His favorite part is when the train would pass through the Hollister Ranch. Paul said each time he would reflect that the Fletcher brothers spent an incredible amount of time there during high school. Paul went to the Thatcher School in Ohio for two years. Paul met the family that sold the ranch to the Mackle Corporation in the 60s. I wonder how the family that sold the ranch feels today. For a surfer, it'd be like selling the keys to heaven. Paul said he would tell stories to his kids about my brother and I. Paul remembers the time in fifth grade where John and I would switch classes. Paul remembers that John and I would switch shir shirts and then go to each other's class. All the students knew my brother and I were playing a joke. At some point in time, the entire class would start laughing. Everyone except for the teacher was on in this joke. The teacher would wonder, <laughs> what's going on? Eventually, the teacher would catch on and we would all laugh. These were simple times. I don't know if today 
the school system would appreciate this. I knew Paul's brothers, Nat, in high school. My brother and I were on the same track team and cross-country team in high school. Nat was best friends with Bruce Charles, a great neighbor of ours. I remember in either fifth or sixth grade, they dressed up as surfers and carried a surfboard for Halloween. I was impressed. I, dis I distinctly remember that I said, someday I'm going to be a surfer. During my phone conversations with Paul, he mentioned that with my travels to India and my love for meditation, did I ever hear about his second cousin? He was somewhat of a black sheep in the family. His name was Bala Ram Dass, formerly known as Richard Albert. Did I know Ram Dass? Did my during my late teens and early 20s, Ram Dass was famous in the meditation community. Richard Albert was a young, young, was a young psychologist during the 60s. He, along with Timothy Leary, began to explore the effects of psychotropic substances on the mind. Both of them worked at Harvard University. They began to do clinical studies on the effects of LSD and psilocybin. At that time, they weren't illegal in the country. At some point, they got fired for doing the research. They had graduate students who actively participated in their research. But one time, they had an undergraduate study student. Consequently, they were fired. Timothy Leary's famous slogan was, Tune in, turn on, drop out. Ram Dass wrote the book, be Here Now, a popular book during the 60s and 70s. Today is considered a modern spiritual classic. In fact, in fact, I read this book at Ananda in Nevada City before I went on my journey. To be honest, at that time, I really didn't understand the book. Books like these take practical experience to understand and to incorporate these ideas in the book. Ram Dass started using drugs and meditated for the rest of a life. He used to say that drums, that drugs were training wheels. At some point, you don't need them anymore. I tried LSD once and never again. The state of meditation brings one into our natural state where we don't need anything artificial to open the door within. So I was completely surprised when Paul <gasps> told me his second cousin was Ram Dass. I saw him speak in Santa Fe, New Mexico during the 70s. I had been impressed by his work. He had tremendous influence in the population at large. He helped to bring meditation to be common among our society. During the 70s, it was considered you were on the fringe of society if you meditated. You were strange. Nowadays, Yoga is mainstream. You can practice it almost everywhere. Synchronicity is so common, yet most of the time we don't see it. Signposts are everywhere, yet we don't have eyes to see. Thanks, Paul, for being my lifelong friend. I'm so happy that we are connected again. We are all on an incredible journey of life. Surfing Adventure. Yesterday, I received this wonderful message and pictures from Brad Schultz. It's amazing that we remember certain memories from past events. Even when we went through the same event, we have our point of view 
and memories. Brad. Here's a blast from the past. Remember our surf adventures to the ranch with your brother and John Smiths? I think we drove up in your Mustang to Halama and then hiked in. As I recall, it was very windy and a minus tide. One of you slipped on the rocks and dislocated an elbow. We scaled the cliffs and flagged down the ranch security guard, and he took us back to the car, and we drove to Lompoc Hospital Emergency, where they popped the elbow back into place. I'm not sure what happened next, but recall resuming our adventure and your parents praising us for our quick thinking. Do you have anything to add? I'm sending this to John, too. Richard. Yep, that was me. I remember we got back to Newport. The next day, you guys surfed at 22nd Street. I waited in the car, and it was freezing. A very, very cold snap hit Newport Beach. The temps were in the 40s. I love the photos. Never saw these before. Looks like another web of life tying us together. Thanks for sharing. I forgot that John Smith was on our journey. Thanks for reminding me. I'm going to put this in my book, Family and Friends. It's a great surf story. It's amazing what surfaces when you combine memories. I have no recollection of surfing at 22nd Street when we got back and dropped you off. John said that he and I drove back to the ranch to complete the adventure. Richard, you did. But before you did, you guys went to 22nd Street. I went along for the ride. Afterwards, you guys went back to the ranch. By the way, I never heard about your adventure afterwards. And I don't recall what happened after we went back. It's kind of funny. Brad didn't know which one broke his elbow and had to be taken to the emergency room. Well, I do. I was the one. I forgot that John Smith came along on this journey. I have a picture for this. I remember how cold it was sitting in the Mustang at 22nd Street. I still can feel the cold. I remember sitting in the car. Thanks, Brad, for sharing this. It's another web tying us together. During the summer of my junior year, my brother and I went to South America. We went to Argentina, Brazil, and Ecuador. Our first stop was with Brazil. A good surfing friend, Steve Lamontagne, had a roommate in college. He was Chinese and lived in Brazil. John invited us to visit him and his family in Rio de Janeiro. His family owned a Chinese restaurant. This is the first time I ever lived inside a Chinese household. Each morning when you have a delicious bowl of soup, this was standard for breakfast. My brother and I loved the Brazilian culture. We went to Christ the Redeemer atop Mount Corvado and were captured by the incredible view of Copacabana and Ipanema. We saw the dire poverty of the shanty town. I don't think you're really to ever get over when you see poverty of this kind. Human beings for thousands of years had to live in such an existence. My brother and I visited Cabo Frio, Frio a small beach town, with three to four hours from Rio. It was off season. We met a beautiful Portuguese family, and they showed us it around this town. It was winter time in Brazil. I was probably in the low 60s. Cold for Brazil. <laughs> We stayed a month in Argentina. There was a small group from our high school who was exchange students. I stayed with Pedro de Sena and his family. Pedro stayed with us two years before. In Argentina, they have café con leche, coffee and milk, and croissants for breakfast. This is the first time I ever tried coffee. The croissants were served with butter and jam. 
The Argentine family was really nice and treated me like a member of their family. Meat is king in Argentina. I was amazed to see that streetcar vendors would serve steak sandwiches. You have better be an adventurous than if you go to a barbecue. I visited a family that took me to their ranch in the Pampas. The cowboys provided an authentic Argentine barbecue. In Argentina, they eat parts of the cow that Americans would never eat. My brother and I had a Forrest Gump moment. We were taking a tour of this government building. They had a person given a tour in Spanish, and I was told to translate in English. We entered this one room and saw a window, and two people were playing chess. One of the players was Bobby Fischer, one of the greatest players in the world. We stayed for only one moment, and then the tour then continued. I think back in Alamada, it was a historical moment in chess history, and we nonchalantly nod our heads and go along our merry way. The Argentines drive like crazy. I thought I drove radically. They would drive fast and furious. Imagine driving down the street at 90 miles per hour and not stopping at stops wide or street signs. If you got a ticket, they would give a bribe to the officer. If you're going to a nightclub or party, it would start around midnight. Nobody ever came on time. A 16-year-old could go to a nightclub and order a shot of whiskey. The most important aspect of their society was family and friends. This was the backbone of life. Yes, the job was important, but it was a great balance between the two. They knew their priorities in life. The bus service in Argentina was first class. We took a bus from Buenos Aires to Marta Pacheco. Imagine the same service you would get on a first class ticket on an airplane. The service was incredible. I stayed with Graciela de Orio, a friend of our family. Marta Plata is a seaside resort. Resort. There is a grand casino overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. We spent about four days there. Surfing was a new spot there. I never had the opportunity to go. When I was there, it was freezing. We parted with our family and friends and took a plane to Ecuador. We stayed with Eduardo Peña and his family. Eduardo stayed with us for one year before he was an exchange student. As you can probably see, I love German kinds of ethnic foods. Eduardo had a housekeeper who made the best potatoes in the world, smoothies. She made all sorts of exotic fruits into delicious drink, mangoes, bananas, papaya, and many others I can't recall. I remember eating fried plantains with rice. Eduardo's family had a friend named Victorio Casado, a famous Spanish bullfighter fighter who was a surfer. He would take my brother and I to surf trips to Guayas. It was about a two-hour journey from Guayaquil. Guayas was a sleepy beach town. They had this small but long lake that broke along the point. My brother and I could see its potential. The beach town resort was known for its fresh fish. It was a delightful time spending time with Victorio and his family. We went several times with him to fly. Eduardo took my brother and I to Quito and Cuenca. In Cuenca, we stayed at his grandmother's house. It was a beautiful place. We were there during the winter, and there was no heating. Brr, it was cold. Cuenca is a city in the southern Andes Mountains. Temperatures are around 58 degrees year-round. Lately, a lot of Americans have moved there to take advantage of the great standard of living. While in Ecuador, we heard the Ecuadorian Navy allowed terrorists to go on tour with them to the Galapagos Islands. We called our parents a few days before school was to start. My parents said it would be okay, but they had to talk to our teachers and principal. We received a, a phone call a few hours later saying it was all right. Our principal said we would learn more traveling than in school. We came back to school three weeks later. The Galapagos Islands was a trip of a lifetime. We went on this old U.S. Navy World War II ship. At this time, there was a tuna boat war between Ecuador and the United States. The Ecuadorian Navy was looking for U.S. tuna boats. We visited Santiago, San Cristobal, Isabel, Fernando, and Isabel Islands. While there, 
I could see why Darwin came up with this theory of evolution. The Galapagos Islands at that time wasn't a tour destination. They contained one of the only giant tor tor tortoises populations in the world. My brother and I were amazed by the size and age of these incredible creatures. I have pictures of seals jumping over my head. My brother said, you had to wait for them, watch for the mom and dad. They were huge and would chase you out of the water and run after you. I remember vividly looking at the waves and I counted over a minute while it broke perfectly. No one had ever ridden this way. I saw years later, they now have, they now have surf excursions to this beautiful place. The first time my brother and I saw iguanas, we were standing at the same spot, looking at the waves, and we sent something we were looking at. We looked around, and there were hundreds of iguanas who were looking at us. They were completely camouflaged. The Navy personnel were, were very kind to us. There was a couple from us in the U.S. and a poet from Argentina on board. We learned a lot about nature. It would be hard not to. Never before have we been in such a pristine environment. While I was in France, one day I woke up and saw huge waves breaking. The waves were probably 15 feet high. The surf spot was at La Barre, a famous but now extinct surf spot. I took off on a huge wave, stood up, and the next moment I was free falling down the wave. From back then, there were no leashes. <coughs> My board got carried to shore. La Barre had a jetty and there were 15 foot waves breaking on the rocks. The rip was so strong, it was like a river. For the first time in my life, I said, Lord, <laughs> if you exist, you had better do something real fast. I closed my eyes and saw an incredible light and a small Indian boy. The next moment I was on shore. Everybody on shore said it was a miracle. The next day I decided to go to India. As I look back at that experience, I felt the hand embraced my life. I felt so protected. Here I was only 18 years old, but I knew my life was protected. I was about to start the adventure of a lifetime. This is definitely a near-death experience for me. In the early 70s, I read books about the death experience, and my experience closely resembled that experience. I saw a great light, which filled my being with beliefs that is boundless. I saw a figure which told me without words that everything would be all right. This experience I knew could be experienced consciously. It didn't have to be a hit or miss affair. I knew a human being could experience the source directly, no matter if he or she were dreaming, sleeping, dreaming, or in a wake state. Man had the ability to tap into the source of life. After my surfing accident, Peter and I started our trip to India. I was very excited. I knew that something wonderful was going to happen in India. All my dreams would come true. We drove from Biarritz to Venice, where we stayed two days with an Italian friend from high school. We drove through Yugoslavia. At that time, it was a communist country. The people at that time were very suspicious of outsiders. They weren't very friendly. The countryside was amazing. We were high up in the mountains and could see the Mediterranean Sea. Peter would drive and had this harmonica that he would play. He was actually a good player. We drove to Athens in Greece. We spent a week there. I loved going to the Parthenon. Harry was in the cradle of such an incredible civilization. I was in awe. We sold our car and took an airplane to Turkey. When we landed in Istanbul, I knew this is where East meets West. The city was so different. The Muslim mosques were so beautiful. The policemen had submachine guns. I never saw that before. 
I remember staying at this house where a lady came in and said we had better leave because the police was going to raid the place. She said people used drugs and the police were going to bust the place. I felt someone taking care of me. I didn't want to end up in a Turkish jail, especially because I don't use drugs. That would be hard to prove in Turkey. We spent a week in Istanbul and they went to Ankara. In Ankara we had to stay a week because the border was closed. The Shah of Iran was having the 1000 year anniversary party for Persia. He didn't want young Westerners or trouble to come to his land for his, this party. I heard that the Shah even built props to hide the poverty. I had a friend who went to, to the party and said it was quite the affair. They had air conditioned tents. The Shah spent thousands of dollars. While in Ankara, we saw the Queen of England in a parade. There were thousands of soldiers carrying submachine guns. After a week, the border was open and we took trains and buses to Iran. It's quite a scene traveling. Both Peter and I carried our surfboards and our packs. The trains were fairly, well, quite dirty and packed. We slept on the floor of the train. The buses were like the trains, but they had livestock on board. I was gaining quite a lesson in, on life. We arrived at the capital of Tehran. Tehran was quite a beautiful city. We found out that a week before, a young American tourist died the, the week before. Supposedly, she entered a Muslim mosque with stoned to death. The reason was that only Muslims could go inside the temple. I met a man from the secret police. He came up to me and said that he killed about 30 Americans this year. In Iran, if they find drugs in you, they would shoot you on the spot. What a way to control the drug problem. We then took buses to the border of Afghanistan. This is where the scenery drastically changed. I felt I was transferred back 2,000 years, 2, years ago. The Afghan people are warriors. Their culture is the same for thousands of years. We were in a high mountain desert. Everyone carried guns or rifles. This is way before the Soviet invasion. I felt I was in a wild west town. There was no law or order. The people were quite nice. But I knew you didn't want to cross them up. The people in Afghanistan smoked a lot of hash. They used this drug like alcohol. The whole nation used it. The food was quite good. We took a bus from the border and made it to Kabul. Along the way, we bumped into this lion named Charlie Krishna. Charlie was a great guy and we traveled together. Kabul at this time was a hangout for the European hippies. The Europeans were heavily involved in drugs. They used a lot of opium. It's quite sad to see people my age totally addicted to opium. There's nothing I can do. Many of them simply wasted away. The drug was very cheap and could be bought anywhere. I knew a lot of my friends in the States would have loved to be in that environment. It was an eye-opening experience. For the first time, I saw so many kids totally wasted and hanging on to life with a thread. They were thousands of miles from home. During this time, I would meditate every day. I knew something incredible was going to happen to me in India. I just had the intuition that my dreams would come true. I wish I would meet someone who could show me the way to open the door. I felt totally protected. It's a beautiful feeling to know that someone is watching over you. I was thousands of miles away from home, and yet I felt great inside. I felt protected. My main goal was to get to India. Ever since I left France, that feeling kept on getting stronger. I felt such a wave and anticipation that my dreams will come true. I had only a short time and be shown to me. I left Kabul and took the Khyber Pass from Afghanistan into Pakistan. The Khyber Pass was used by Genghis Khan. It's one of the oldest trade routes in the world. Throughout history, it has been an important trade route between Central Asia and India. What a radical road, it was all dirt, which most of Afghanistan was. There was no guardrails, and we had these crazy drivers driving as fast as they could down the pass. The buses were quite different. Each bus would have a different altar depending on which religion they belonged to. There would be flowers, incense, 
pictures and memorabilia. We'll be driving down this huge mountain on a skinny road. This was the one and only route from Afghanistan to Pakistan. Well, we finally made it to Pakistan. Lahore was a busy city. We only stayed for a few days. When I was in Pakistan, I saw signs saying crush India. When I arrived in India, I saw signs crush Pakistan. I arrived at the border of India at the beginning of the Indian-Pakistan War. The following day, the border was closed for five years. My first day in India was incredible. I remember crossing the border. At this time, there was a two mile walk to reach the border, check for India. There were parrots and wild birds everywhere. I felt such a strong spiritual experience. I was home. It's hard to put in words what I was feeling. I knew something incredible was to happen to me in India. I was looking for a teacher who would give me a practical experience of who I was. I remember being checked by an Indian custom lady who was famous for busting people for bringing in drugs into India. Since I didn't use drugs, I wasn't worried. I remember such an aura of peace that came over me. The sun was just setting, and the whole forest was alive. Thousands of parrots were in the forest. The smell was like an incredible per perfume in the air. I crossed the border and took an overnight train to New Delhi. When I got to New Delhi, I was very tired and exhausted. I heard rumors that the Sikhs allowed people to stay at their temple. I went to this huge Sikh temple. I asked, can I stay here overnight? The man said no, but there's a huge festival going on down the block. The festival is for Maharaji. A 13-year-old boy who just came back from a, a tour of the West. I remember four months earlier reading about him in Time Magazine from my sister. I was intrigued how a 13-year-old boy could have such a huge following. I arrived at the festival site and was escorted to the stage where one million people were sitting. It was amazing, a sea of people. The next thing I knew, a young Indian boy walked on the stage wearing a Krishna outfit. He was wearing a gold crown with jewels and a gold outfit. I was laughing and crying at the same time. Something inside of me knew I was home, that the experience I was looking for could be shown by this Indian boy. Being 18 years old, I was very practical that I wanted a direct experience of God inside of me. What this young Indian boy said made sense. He said, seeing is believing. If I told you an ant was 10 feet tall, would you believe me? But if I showed you, seeing is believing. He said, don't believe in my words. Take my experience. See for yourself. If it suits your practice, if not, go on your way. At this time of my life, this made sense. I have never heard someone saying, I can reveal who you really are. All my teachers in the past said believe, and maybe someday you will have that experience. Rani said, take that experience, practice it, and let the seed move into a fruit tree.
The following day, I packed up my bags and took a train to Bremnagar. Maranti's ashram is near Hardwar. It's a small town in the foothills of Himalaya. The next two weeks, I listened to discourses about this knowledge. Something inside of me knew that it was to receive the experience of a lifetime. I knew the door to my soul was to be open. Words are hard to express the feeling that was going inside of my being. I knew that in a short time I'd be shown and would reveal the secret of life itself. I knew this experience was real. I told a lot of people who had the experience I could tell and sense that something wonderful was going on. I liked it, the idea that the proof is in the pudding. I didn't want to join a cult or religious group. I just wanted a direct and continuous experience of the power that's keeping me alive. I knew through practice this could be achieved. During this time, the war between India and Pakistan was going on. Each night there were air raid sirens going on and off in the distance we could hear bombs going off. There was a general blackout at night. Pakistani bombers were only miles away. Air raid sirens were heard in the distance. At the ashram, the whole place was so serene while this part of the world, people were dying. Trains of Pakistanis were being massacred going from India to Pakistan, and train loads of Indians were being massacred going from Pakistan into India. Such a dichotomy. I'll never forget my initiation. There were probably about 20 of us in a small room. Maraji had initiators who revealed his knowledge. We were in the room while Maraji was playing on top of the roof directly overhead of us. This experience that I had that day still sends shivers of joy, just merely the thought. The first technique the initiator revealed was the light technique. I always knew that the human being had the ability to see the light inside. This is an actual experience. When the initiator touched my forehead, I felt this incredible surge of energy. I knew at that point that something incredible was going to happen. My whole body and soul sensed it. Sensed it. My consciousness completely left its physical existence. A golden circle of light appeared. Inside of this circle, a brilliant blue star appeared. This golden circle of light and this blue star was so beautiful. It's probably the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Waves of love, joy, and peace were surging inside my consciousness. All of a sudden, the store transferred into a ray, a tunnel, a blue light, which went on for infinity. I merged with the blue ray. It's very hard to describe this experience. I was at home. The doors were open. I was given the keys and it was up to me to cultivate that experience. I have definite proof that we are more than these bodies. All of a sudden, the mystery of life was revealed. I knew the secrets behind our religion. There was, there was a genuine experience that could be shown and experienced. Years later, I realized that this experience was initiation into Lord's Michael Blue Ray. It was the Jacob's Ladder. This experience was the ladder to God. To this day, I'll never forget this experience. It gave me practical proof that God exists. I knew it, but this was a practical experience. It was more real than any outside human experience. I knew my life was on track. I waited years to go home. I was shown such a glorious place. When I returned to this body and regained physical consciousness, my whole body was shaking like a duck. My body had a hard time. Can you imagine being hooked up to the power plant of the whole universe? I knew no damage was done. Over time, I knew that the body was built and designed to handle these kinds of currents. Day by day, through meditation, man can slowly harmonize with these frequencies and begin to vibrate at this frequency. There were three other techniques that were revealed. One was the music technique. I was shown how to listen to the innermost frequencies of life. Since God is energy, man has the capability to be in tune and listen to subtle yet energy frequencies. Different religions have different concepts about this experience. By listening to this music over time, man is filled with such a joy and peace in his life. The mind slowly begins to slow down. 
in this state man gets in contact with an energy frequency that is infinite. This energy is pure love of bliss. The whole universe is comprised of this energy. It was, is, and will always be. This is the word of God. Every major religion talks about the word in some form or another. This is a very simple technique where man can be in direct communication with the subtle energy. When a person first receives this initiation, the word is very subtle. The majority of people really don't understand the power of this word. I know a lot of people who took this experience and never really tried it out. Over time, I can consciously put myself in direct communication with this word. My whole being is instantly filled with such a wave of love and bliss. I'm out there 24 hours a day, but I know it's possible. I have had experiences that I was completely taken out of this physical world and taken into a place where there's no time and space. The only thing that existed was this incredible energy of love. I know I was at home with my father. This energy exists throughout all creation. It exists in the manifest and unmanifest. It exists throughout time and space and beyond. All of creation came from this word. In the Bible in St. John, the verse goes like this. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Human beings have the capability to tune it into this experience. The last experience was one of the living waters or nectar experience. When man, when man is in this experience, powerful hormones and enzymes are secreted through the endocrine system. Through the ages, man has learned that he has a capability to actually experience this nectar or living water. Just one drop of this is an incredible, powerful experience. One drop has the capability to take man consciousness into a definite, altered state. This fluid is very cleansing to the body. When Christ was in the desert for 40 days and nights, he lived off his, this mana. This experience is energy in its subtle form. It is energy, yet it transmutes, transmutes itself into matter. This experience is very powerful to the endocrine system. I've had numerous experiences of this nectar. It's probably the most intoxicating drug known in the universe. Unlike a drug which has side effects, this experience is completely beneficial to the body and soul. These experiences reveal over time who we truly are. We are more than our mind and body. We are in fact the source of life. Each one of us are part of this universal consciousness. We just don't remember it. It's amazing when we were born, we came from the source. Our whole body was this consciousness. Over time, we forgot. Years later, we have completely forgot of our true existence. After the, the initiation, I thank my Creator for revealing Himself to me. My dreams come true. I have the tools. Everything made sense to me. I could read the scriptures and understand the hidden meaning. The scriptures were, the, were at the same wavelength. I had a lot of respect for the major religions. The following day, I was sit sitting by the Ganges meditate when I completely lost consciousness of this planet. I saw a light more brilliant than the noonday sun. My consciousness was flowing into a river of nectar. I felt the whole Ganges river was flowing through me. Maraji had a beautiful poem by Rumi, a great Sufi teacher that sums it up. It goes like this. There is a palace in the sky without any foundation. A blind man sees a light more brilliant than a million suns. 
A deaf man listens to the unstruck music. A lame man climbs up a well and drinks the nectar, becomes totally intoxicated. The quinter is only a wise man understands what I'm talking about. From then on, my life was to change drastically. After my initiation and its experience, my life was never the same. I was shown something so incredible that my focus was on this experience. My whole life from then on was based upon practically cultivating this experience. Day by day, I was going deeper and deeper into my existence. My days in India were spent in meditation and spending time with Miranda. Meditation was such an, an incredible experience. I call it going to the movies. Day by day, I was going deeper and deeper into a realm I've never been before. Premnagar was such a beautiful place. I was thousands of miles away from home, and then again, I was truly at home. I was content and full of such an incredible bliss. My mind was learning to focus on something inside of me that never changes, that was and will always be. I was learning how to be connected to that experience 24 hours a day. I practiced meditation like how I surf with joy and the thrill of riding the waves of life. To this day, I'm still blown away that this experience is lying dormant inside of humanity, just waiting to be discovered. We are searching for the jewel, and the jewel is hidden inside of each one of us. Over time, it's not all bliss and roses with the experience. I had to face my mind. The mind is such a powerful thing. It can be your friend or enemy. I learned over time to become its friend. In the beginning, at times, I thought I would go crazy. The mind was constantly chattering. I would sit for hours, and at times, I wanted to get up and just forget the whole thing. But then I would break through. Then that experience would rush in and completely saturate your being. You are bliss. I felt that I had to break down the door. Over time, I walked through the door, and my mind, my mind hasn't bothered me in this way since. I'm not saying my mind doesn't bother me. At times it does. But when I close my eyes or put my connection on this Word of God, my whole being is filled with bliss. In the beginning, it took tremendous effort to have this kind of experience. In the beginning, you meditate on the experience. Years later, that experience meditates on you. I remember that a few days before Christmas, the whole ashram took a train ride from hard work to Patna, a city in Bihar, India. Bihar is one of the far states in India. The scenery was beautiful. We were traveling on this old, funky Indian train. We could see swamps that were full of lotus flowers. Wildlife was everywhere. Raju was having a three-day program. I remember at the festival, there was probably a million people there. At one point in the festival, the Ari Samaj attacked the festival. I'm not sure how many people died. The group caused a lot of trouble in India. It was kind of scary to, to sit on stage watching fighting only a half mile away. India was quite a different place. The people were quite friendly. They liked Westerners. The Indian people in general had a strong conviction for God. Before leaving to Bihar, my friend Peter left to go back to America. I loaned him the money, which I got back in South Africa. The Westerners left in January. There were only a few of us left. I spent my remaining time in Delhi. I remember I would meditate and go into town. The Indian food was great. I bumped into the son of James R. Nance. His father was a famous actor in Hollywood. He played in Gunsmoke on TV. He had a son, Ralph, at the time, who was a world champion surfer. It was quite funny meeting him. I was buying a kilo of cashews for one dollar. I just started talking to him. During this time, Raji was planning to go to South Africa. He, he needed a few Westerners to go and help set up the necessary arrangement. Somehow, Maraji's mother asked me to go. So in early February, we embarked to Bombay. The journey with the girls. I look back now on this incredible journey 
that I was going to embark on. Let me introduce you to Kali Rodriguez, Kathleen Cook, aka Cookie, and Tess Davis. These were my traveling partners on this journey. We were going to hitchhike from Kenya to South Africa. I asked Miraji if we are going to make it there alive. He said, yes, you're going to have a hell of a lot of ventures along the way. To this day, I wonder why we never just didn't take a plane to South Africa. But that wouldn't be a journey, would it? I was just 19 years old, a mere kid, yet I learned so much on this journey. We took a train from Delhi to Bombay. Raji was in Bombay for a week. Upon reaching the train station, I realized that I lost the directions to the ashram. I just left and knew that everything would be all right. I was traveling with three Western girls. I said, let's go hop in a taxi. We got in a taxi and the driver said, where you want to go? I said, we will direct you. Bombay is a huge city. None of us had ever been there, and, and he couldn't believe it. But he did, as he was told. I closed my eyes and received directions on where to go, left, right, etc. After about 45 minutes of, driver, of driving, I told the driver to stop. We got out of the car, knocked on the door, and walked right into the ashram. I never told Raji how we got there. It was just a matter of fact. Before we left to Kenya, Maragi asked us who wanted any holy water. Holy water is a custom in India when the master places its foot in water. I only had a canteen and Maragi placed its foot inside of the canteen. We all laughed. The next day we headed out to Kenya. On board the plane was Kali, Kathleen and Tess. These were the three girls I traveled with from New Delhi. On board the plane, we drank the water from the canteen. All of us got roof-roaring drunk. I've been drunk prior to that once or twice, but this is a drunk of joy. We all somehow managed to saunter off the plane. We spent a few days in Nairobi. Tess's parents lived on the outskirts of town. Kenya was an incredible country. Parts of it looked like England. We relaxed for a few days. I remember one moment at Tess's house, I was meditating in the backyard. I opened my eyes and saw Miraji standing there. He was laughing and laughing. I remember in Bombay asking him if we were to make it to South Africa. We were going to hitchhike from Kenya to South Africa. He said we would, but we were going to have a hell of a lot of ventures along the way. We slowly started to hitchhike from Kenya to South Africa. I have memories of our first night getting a ride and being on the King's Plains in a horrendous rainstorm. Here we were in Africa and the only houses around were grass huts. It was quite an experience. I remember one border crossing between Kenya and Tanzania. The Tanzanian border official became very upset because we didn't have a visa to enter the country. Kali became very upset and told the guy off. I was receiving an intuition to be quiet and to respect this officer. They pulled us into a room and this officer just started to yell to call it. All of a sudden he stopped and said, I'm about to throw both of you in jail, but because according to me you've been such a gentleman, I will let you go. Another lesson in intuition. In Tanzania, the Chinese were pulled in a rave Thousands of Chinese truck drivers were passing by. They all had the same expression on their faces. I remember one ride where Kali and I got picked up by two intelligent black Africans. We got in the color. 
After a few hours of driving, they got out of the car and shot two cows with a rifle. We thought we were next. They got in the car and said, Oh, we just shot two elephants. We agreed with them. We knew we, we shouldn't cause any conflict or maybe we would be next. I remember one night we were in a small jungle of town in the middle of nowhere. I was eating this soup that was full of mosquitoes. The air was so thick with mosquitoes that mosquitoes were falling into my soup. It was quite the scene. It was super humid and hot. I was lucky not to get malaria. One night, we were sleeping in the tent when a huge thunderstorm came and blew away the tent. We awoke and found ourselves sleeping in a sea of mud. Quite the experience. I remember looking at the telephone poles and seeing Raji laughing and laughing. Well, we finally met up with Tess and Kathleen. We switched partners and I hitchhiked with Tess to the cafe of Zambia. We all de decided to meet there. It was quite an experience. We arrived at Lusaka, got out of the car, and moments later, Kali and Kathleen got out of the car. We were all standing there when the Zambian came up to us and offered us to stay at his house. We went to his house, a dairy in the country. His name was Gary. We told him what we were doing and where we were going. At this time, our money situation was zero. A few days before, we ran out of money. I was pleased because I would see that everything would be taken care of. Anyway, Gary's uncle was president of the national TV in Zambia. He could arrange a television interview for us. The next day, around five o'clock, after the news, we were on national television. I only wore my Indian whites and no shoes. We had a beautiful interview for about one hour. The interviewer was very sincere. There was no sarcasm in his voice. The people of Africa were simple and open people. The TV station received hundreds of phone calls asking, what was that? The response was so great that the next day we were asked back to the TV station. The same phenomena happened. The Indian community heard us and invited us to their community. Every day we would have we would give discourses in their temples and homes. We were treated like kings and queens. They would give us money, watches, and clothes. We had probably at least six major meals a day. It is a custom to accept food at someone's home. Each one of our guests would would provide a huge spread. I remember one Hindu temple where the priest would take down Krishna's picture and put up Raji's picture. This is like the Catholic Church taking down Christ's picture. I remember seeing the Victoria Falls like it was yesterday. There was hundreds of monkeys in a forest canopy overlooking this incredible waterfall. Kali and I st <coughs> stood on this bridge and a 360 degree rainbow encircled us. To this day, I can visualize this waterfall. Well, we finally made it to Johannesburg. It was quite the adventure. Somehow we managed to get a visa for South Africa. I spent about two weeks in Johannesburg resting up and living in the Indian community. 
There were a lot of Westerners, Black, and Indians, Indians interested. I was sent to Cape Town to prepare for Marathi's visit. In Cape Town, I stayed in the house of Nigel Ferret. Nigel and his, and his house were great to me. They lived in, a, in town in an old 17th century church. Cape Town was a beautiful place to live. The Cape is surrounded by the Indian and Atlantic Ocean. Nigel introduced me to a fellow surfer, Chris Parker. We became great friends. I hadn't spoken to him in over 40 years until recently. We carried our conversation as it was just yesterday. My days in Cape Town were spent in preparation for Maraki coming to visit. I would go to the university there and give talks about self-knowledge. The university and student body provided me with a classroom where I could speak. It's kind of funny, I was only 19 years old. The university was real receptive and curious. When Raji came to, the, to give a talk at the university, the whole student body showed up. I had a great time with Raji in Cape Town. There was only one other Westerner besides me. He was Gary Gerard, he was traveling with him. I remember at one point I was in Raji's room. We were alone, he was talking about his father, Sri Raji. I remember asking questions about his father. Raji gave me this magazine that came from England. It contained some of his discourses in England. On the back page was this picture of him. He gave me this magazine and signed it, Sanchi Maharaj. On the back of the magazine, he drew a map of his old school in Dehradun, India. One day we went to the Cape of Good Hope. It was an incredible sight to behold the Atlantic and Indian Ocean merging together at one point. I remember at one point Miraji and the group had a race to get to the top of the stairs. I couldn't believe how fast he ran. He beat all of us by a long shot. I thought with all my training, I was fast. When I got to the top, I was breathing quite hard. Miraji was hardly breathing. I remember at one point a South African uh, photographer took our picture. There was three of us, Miraji, his longtime bodyguard, Bihari Singh and myself. We placed our arms on top of each other's shoulders, just like kids, and said cheese. It was a great moment. The following day, we flew back to Johannesburg. I remember Maranji passing out Nestle's white chocolates in the plane. We spent another two weeks in Johannesburg. Every day, we would have people from all of our race, colors, and creed come to the house. For some reason, the South African government didn't do anything about it. We had Westerners, Blacks, and Indians all coming together. There was such a harmony. I flew it with Maranji back to England. I remember the day after I got back, Maranji was speaking to a large group of people. I walked into their room and he stopped speaking and turned to me. He said, right now, my body is in England, but my soul is in South Africa. It was a remarkable statement. The South African people, people captured his heart. Chris Parker. I first met Chris in Cape Town, South Africa, over 45 years ago. We became instant friends. I introduced Chris to meditation. Now, if you'd like to meditate, and you're a surfer, you're on the same wavelength. Chris and Nigel are like brothers to me, yet I haven't seen them since my time in Cape Town. In fact, it wasn't until recently that we hook up again. We discovered each other through Facebook. All three of us would have Skype sessions. Nigel in South Africa, Chris in Australia, and myself in good old Kansas. We would talk at times for three hours. Now that's a good use of technology. It seems just like yesterday. Now, I've known them for probably less than six months, yet the connection between all of us is like brothers. I find that fascinating.
Kali Rodriguez. I first met Kali in India in 1971. We hitchhiked with, Jane, with Kathleen Cook and Tess Davies from Kenya to South Africa. To this day, I wonder why didn't we fly? But it was an incredible adventure. Read the chapter Travels in Africa. I first learned how to cook Indian food from Kali. She at various times became Raji's cook. Indian food at that time was very exotic and different. Kali taught me the ropes. She taught me the main concepts. I remember Kali teaching me how to cook dal. Dal is one of my favorite comfort foods. There is a step where you get a cast iron pan, heat up some ghee, clarified butter, and place cumin seeds in the pan. The cumin seeds will begin to pop and the room will be filled with this incredible smell of the roasted cumin seeds. You then add chopped onions, garlic, tomatoes, ginger, and dried chili peppers. This step is called making the chunk. You saute this until the mixture turns golden brown. When it does, this mixture is poured into the doll and makes this incredibly sizzling sound. You have to be careful to use the lid to cover the doll so you won't get burned. Anyway, I have probably made this hundreds of times and I never duplicated that sound. Now I'm a good Indian cook, but Kali has taken it to a higher level. I still remember it. I still remember that sizzling sound in my mind. Kali has a love and adventure for life. She was a great travel partner. She was easygoing and had a great attitude. It was an amazing journey. Kali's grandfather was president of Mexico at some time. Her mom danced with Esther Williams. I stayed at Kali's mom's house in the 70s and she was a great host. I could see in Kali a lot of her mom. This house was at the tip of Baja. At that time, this part of Baja was relatively unknown, not today. Kali had a great singing voice. She played the guitar and sang these incredible songs. I feel meditation brings the soul to the surface. When she sang, I could feel the sweetness coming from within her. When I think about Kali, I can hear her singing. She had this hunting effect, much like the Irish singers, such as Enya. Music, if done properly, is a manifestation coming from God. I have nothing but great memories of Kali. She will always be dear to my heart. Kathleen Cook, a.k.a. Cookie. I first met Kathleen, a.k.a. Cookie, in Premagar Island in 1971. I was only 18 years old. Kathleen told me a beautiful story that occurred only a few months previously. Somehow, she bumped into Miranji at Bihari scene in the streets of San Francisco. Miranji was given a talk there. Somehow the details are fuzzy. They asked Cookie if she could drive them to Los Angeles. So she borrows a beat up Volkswagen and had the adventures of her life. Ranji was only 13 years old at that time. Cookie was one of my traveling partners on the journeys in Africa. She remembers the time when taking a train from New Delhi to Bombay, now called Mumbai. Mumbai. The trains were super dirty. I think I had to sleep on the dirty floor. We reached our destination, and we all realized that no one had the directions. 
I was quite young and naive. Maybe, or maybe not, I had no fear. We get in this taxi and the driver says, well, where do you want to go? And I said, I'll direct you there. So we drive for about 45 minutes. I'm getting signals to turn left and turn right. At some point, I tell the driver to stop. We get out of the car, knock on the door, and guess who's inside? Miraji and Bihari Singh. At that time, we really didn't think anything about it. We had faith. At the same time, meditation helps to bring up the subconscious where events like this can happen. Well, we were in Bombay one day. I was in Miraji's room, when all of a sudden, he got off his bed, stood up, and started to wave his hands toward one of his initiators, Ashoka Nun. The hair on his whole body stood up. It looked like he put his hand in a light socket. He was yelling, please, Raji, stop it. After about 10 seconds, Raji's hand fell to the side, and Ashoka Nun was back to normal. Being that 18 year old kid that I was, I said, hey, Raji, do you want to zap him once more? Raji said, sure, and for just a fraction of a second, he raised his hands and put electricity back into him. Raji was electrocuting him. We all laughed. This is my first time that I spent close time with Raji. Cookie and Kali were present in the room. It was so beautiful to play with Raji, at the same time, have a great respect for him. Before we left to Kenya, Raji asked us if we wanted any holy water. Holy water is a custom in India where the master places his foot in water. I had only a canteen and Raji placed his foot inside of the canteen. We all laughed. The next day we headed out for Kenya. On board the plane was Kali, Kathleen and Tess. These were the three girls I traveled with <coughs> from <coughs> New Delhi. On board the plane we drank the water from the canteen. All of us got rip roaring drunk. I had been drunk prior to that once or twice, but this was a drunk of joy. We all somehow managed to saunter off the plane. We spent a few days in Nairobi. Tess's uh, parents lived on the outskirts of town. Kenya was an incredible country, part of it like England. It was so much fun traveling with Cookie. We had had hardships along the journey, but it didn't bother us. I can't imagine hitchhiking through Africa today. We made it to South Africa. We spent a few weeks in Johannesburg, and then Cookie was sent to Durban, and I was sent to Cape Town to prepare for Miraji's visit. As Miraji was leaving Africa, he told Cookie, Kali, and I to help him his coming to San Francisco. I flew with Miraji back to England. I remember the day after I got back, Miraji was speaking to a large group of people I walked into their room and he stopped speaking and turned to me. He said, right now, my body is in England, but my soul is in South Africa. It was a remark <coughs> remarkable statement. The South African people captured his heart. I stayed a few weeks at home and then I, I took <coughs> the Amtrak train from LA to San Francisco with Kali. We go by the Hollister Rants and floods of memories come up. We arrive in San Francisco and catch up with Cookie. Raji came and did a program at the University of Berkeley. I saw Cookie on and off throughout the years. She always inspired me. She loves to meditate. <coughs> she also became an, an exceptional chef. She cooked for many people in Hollywood. I didn't know that until years later. My daughter, Aaliyah, lives in Ashland, Oregon. <coughs> and we visit her about twice a year. Well, guess who moved to Ashland? Yep, Kathleen Cook. We have seen each other a few times in the past few years. I've, take, I've taken her to an Indian restaurant a few times, and she came <coughs> to my birthday party at a Mexican restaurant on Christmas Eve. My mom had Mexican food the night I was born, and it's a family tradition. <coughs> it's always a delight of being with Cookie. She lights up the room. I love her laugh. I can hear her soul coming out. 
cookie keeps up in the current events in the world, so conversation can be quite lively. We talk about old times and how fortunate we are. I'm so glad that she is a web <coughs> in my life. <clears throat> cookie, from the bottom of my heart, thanks for all you do. <clears throat> mm-hmm.